Okay, so normally I do a, a reading for uh, tithe and offerings. Two weeks ago, I had mentioned that our uh, American money has In God We Trust on it. And I mentioned that in passing. So that, in my mind, caused me to follow that rabbit hole all the way around. And so, so I did a little research and came up with some interesting facts. Um, it, the, the In God We Trust has been on our money multiple times, but the last time is when it was put in by an act of Congress. Uh, in 1955, Democratic Representative Charles Bennett of Florida introduced House Resolution 619, which obliged In God We Trust to be printed on all banknotes, struck on all coins, arguing that in these days where imperialistic and materialistic communism seek to attack and destroy freedom, we should continue to look for ways to strengthen the foundations of our freedom, specifically citing God is the foundation of our freedom in America. And as I was doing this reading, I looked through some of the, the documents of the founding fathers. And I noticed if you read the Declaration of Independence, it's a prayer. And all of these documents indicate that God, our Father, multiple times, the Great One, is always in these founding documents as the basis of our country and as the basis of our freedoms in our life. And I think it's important for us on occasion to remember that this is what the founders believed. This is what our country was built on. This is how we as Americans feel inside that in God we trust. And it's always that way. And it's so cool that he left these little breadcrumbs for us to find. And every once in a while, you're like, oh, wow, yeah, that's there. And so the next time you pull out your wallet and you're buying a, a Slurpee or whatever, you're going to look at that dollar bill and you're going to go like, oh, well, actually a five. You're going to look at that and you're going to go, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Inflation is catching up. <laughs> and you're gonna get you're gonna say, oh my goodness, look at that. In God we trust. So if you bow your heads with me, please. Dear Lord, I so thank you that you leave these these small Easter eggs here for me to, to find and, and to remind myself that the basis for my entire life, my family, my friends, my country, my freedoms, everything is based on you and through you and what you have given me. So truly, in God we trust is correct. Please accept my tithe and offerings in the manner in which I give it. With a cheerful heart, thankful even that I'm allowed to do such. And, and I'm just so blessed to be able to worship you in this way. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, while the, the baskets are going back, I have a few announcements for you all. Uh, first off, youth group will go at noon to two at Summer's house. Don't ask me where Summer's house is, okay? But the, the youth group knows. Um, wood project. So we have zero deliveries to do, but uh, I guarantee you we will have a bu bucket load of deliveries to do next year. So starting the second Saturday, starting next month, the second Saturday uh, of each month, we will be out there working to make all the big pieces of wood into little pieces of wood. And hopefully we can do it before it gets to be 100 degrees. Uh, women's Bible study is tonight. Um, baptisms will go next month. And for um, the gentlemen, don't forget Wednesday is Valentine's Day. So you have plenty of time. Uh, you will even have time on Wednesday to go stop off at the Quickie Mart, get a, a small box of chocolates and a single rose, and like me, you will be out of the doghouse. Okay. Uh, and the last thing I have is uh, I know my brother-in-law is watching online, so hello, Jim. How are you? Okay. And with that, I'm going to turn it over for Joe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bo. Uh, I'm sure we have a church full of Swifties out here. <laughs> ah. 
youth group uh, uh, is going to be playing pickleball and other games. So um, if you want to disguise yourself as a youth and bring your paddle, we're going to be playing over at the park. What's the name of the park? Sam Johnson. Thank you. And uh, we're going to go until 2 o'clock, and then we'll disperse. I want to share with you today the beginning of a new series, and this series is uh, Finding the Leader Within, because I think God is calling us to a new day as followers of Jesus in a culture that needs strong leaders. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to change your whole personality to be a leader. There is a, um, a phenomenon that has taken place in our world. It is called influencers online. <laughs> they make a ton of money. They go buy things at the dollar store, make something cute, and put it online, and the dollar store sends them all kinds of money for doing it. They're influencers. They're influencers for their sake, though. They're influencers to make themselves wealthy, and I, I guess what I want to talk to you today about is leadership is, in essence, being an influencer, but when you're talking about Jesus' kind of leadership that he's calling us to do, he is calling us to not just influence, but help people go from a place where they're at to a place closer to the Lord, a place where they know Jesus better, where they, a place in their life that brings uh, a, a stronger presence of who he is, and because we are in a culture where leadership is so hard to define. So I'm going to spend a little time here, about four weeks, studying the book of Titus. The book of Titus is a story of Paul the Apostle who wrote a letter to Titus, his son in the faith, one of his people that he had trained and mentored on the island of Crete. Now, Crete was an island, it still is an island, in, <laughs> in the Greek Isles. It's one of those. It's a big island. There's about a, a, a million people live on it, close to it. And there's uh, mountain peaks, and it's a, it's a whole, uh, almost like a culture unto itself. And it was that way in Paul's day. Rome had taken over Crete and was running the show in Crete. So there were uh, all kinds of um, influences there. But Paul, after one of his prison uh, stints in Rome, spent some time on his way in, in Crete and, and shared the gospel. And people came to know Jesus. And there were churches started in house churches. And then there was, uh, he had to leave and go do other things. And the, they were kind of uh, leaderless in some ways. And there were some people, and we'll talk about that in the coming weeks, that were causing problems, that were, that were influencing in a negative way. And, and Paul sends this letter to Titus saying, hey, Titus, I want you to go uh, do some work for us in Crete. Okay, so I'm going to just read that, the first five verses of the book of Titus. <clears throat> Excuse me. Paul, a servant of God. Oh, can I, can I just stop? Can everybody, can everybody hear me? That's because we got a new sound system. <laughs> and there were, you know, all kinds of equipment up here. And now it's, I feel like I'm, I can run back and forth on the platform. <laughs> Probably won't, but I could. And thank you for those who worked so hard to put that in. Some of you gave money. Some of you gave time. Some of you just prayed that something would change. <laughs> I'll never forget the Sunday when everything went down and it was feedbacking and all kinds of things. Feeding back is the right word. But anyway, it was. And somebody came up with a very large offering afterwards. It's please do something with the sound system. <laughs> There's different ways of raising money. <laughs> we should read the Bible. Here we go. <laughs> Titus. Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, 
who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now is at his appointed season. He has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. That's all Paul the Apostle saying. Now he addresses Titus. To Titus, my true son, in our common faith. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Um, John Maxwell said Le leadership is simply influencing. It's simply influencing. But now that we have influencers, I want to take it to a, another level and say godly or Jesus kind of leadership is influencing people to know him more. It's not influencing people for my sake or to build my empire or my kingdom or my or to have a following of me. Uh, I get really uncomfortable when they say things like, I'm sitting under the ministry of Joe Pearson. First of all, under, what are you doing under there? <laughs> I know it's an old term and it's kind of a submissive thing, I get it. But <clears throat> can I just for a minute give us all permission to be the shepherds that God has called us to be? The under shepherds. I'm an under shepherd, you're an under shepherd, we're all in the same boat. I don't like the word lay ministry. You are a minister of the gospel as much as anybody as you share Jesus. The worst thing about the word lay ministry, it just implies that you're just laying around. <laughs> and God has called you like he's called me. There's a reason that we don't view uh, the pastoral role. I get it. I'm, pla I'm placed in the leadership of this church. And at the end of this month, we're going to establish leadership for another year. But we're all just playing roles. We're not like over the top of you. We're underneath of you. And we're trying to help guide the, the direction of this church. And we're asking for prayer for that. And it might be your turn to do that one of these years. And I'm just saying, if it's not your turn to do it this year, stay in prayer, stay in work. And you're un understand that the roles are not a hierarchy. The leadership in the kingdom of God is there's Jesus and then there's the rest of us. You understand that. So your pastor will probably not have a helicopter flying from here to some other place. <laughs> it's just too expensive. And I hate high things. <laughs> okay, so um, in fact, I struggled with this uh, when God was working on us to be a church planter. I, I had to succumb to his... Uh, will of calling me to be a pastor, I had a bad, judgy attitude about pastors. Because the ones I knew, and my some of the ones I knew, not all of them, I had some amazing pastors that had grown up, but then I had some, some examples that I didn't want to be like. They wore funny shoes, you know, they, they came to football games in their fancy church shoes, and it's like, who are you? And then you had to call them, you know, in those days, you never used their first names, and you couldn't you couldn't call them their their first names. It was disrespectful, and I couldn't figure that out for the life of me. So I was like fighting this 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 idea of, and I, it was like God got, broke through to me and and said to me, "I'm not trying to call someone else. I'm trying to call you." And, how, and I want you to know that God is not trying to call you to be someone else. He is calling you and who you are and how you are actually is what he loves about you. So when you interact in the world you're in, he is going to use you as a leader at the moment that somebody needs it. Yes. Oh, that's exciting. So good. I was, I, we had a family reunion uh, for my in-laws uh, well, they were at their place, and Lila sent me on a potato mission to get potato salad. And so I go down to the store, 
at, with my brother-in-law, and we were supposed to hurry and go fast. Well, I get to Albertsons, and I start, I zipped into, I had a good spot, and I jumped out, and oh, a lady was laying on the, on the pavement. You know, and there's nothing worse than trying to step over someone on your way. <laughs> It's not to be done. It's not a very Jesus thing to do. <laughs> we, we had a youth, troop, a youth trip one time, and we got out of the train station. We were on our way to go help the poor, and there were people in our way that were sleeping on the sidewalks. And one of our youth said, hey, we're stepping over people who are homeless to go minister to poor people? It was like, oh. Well, anyway, this lady was laying there. And I was in a hurry. God, in his mercy, sent another guy who was an amazing person. Who's, who, after I was talking with her, he interjected and started taking over. She was 81 years old, lost her husband four years ago. Her dog was in her house, and so she didn't want to go to the hospital and not have somebody take care of her dog. She didn't have anybody to drive her there. She had no kids in the state. These, this is real stuff. And this guy stepped up and said, you know what? Here's my phone number. I'll drive you from the hospital back to your house when you're done. I'll keep track of you. And, you know, that was amazing. And not just because I was in a hurry. It was amazing because she needed someone to be leadership in her life at that moment and step into that role. And it wasn't me. It was him. And he was a really wonderful dude. And I, I went in the store, got my stuff. I came back and talked with him. And she was loaded up and they were hauling her away. And he, he said, I got this. I, I'll, be, I'll take care of it. Wow. Do you know that God wants to use you in moments, in times when there is all kinds of situations? Let's examine leadership today. And let's, as we go through this series, let's have an eye on what God might want to do. Because the leadership within is something that emerges in big moments. It's something that takes place at a moment when you are needed. Crete had a whole bunch of churches that weren't doing well. Paul dispatches Titus and, and a letter to Titus and says, Titus, finish the work. Okay, here's let's let's talk about how this came to be. First of all, if you're filling in the blanks, leaders develop sons and daughters. Leaders have an eye to develop and especially uh, sons and daughters in the faith. It's important that you live your life realizing it's not just about you, actually, and it's not just about your family, actually. It's about you and your family and all the people that you come in contact with and all the family members come in contact with. This thing is a ripple effect. And you don't know who you're making a difference in, in their lives. And you may not know ever until heaven, but you may not know the rest of your life what a difference you might have made. I had a, a wonderful man in my life named Bill Libby. I miss him every day. He passed about four years ago. And his wife, Sheila, still lives. And she moved to Pendleton. What wonderful people. They were pastors for many years, pastored mostly small churches, and spent a lot of time in Cottonwood, California, where he planted the first church, and he would tell me about his days roofing because he was a bivocational pastor, and I, I as well, and we, we loved to do that, and he uh, was a great roofer. He would hire people in his church to come and help him roof, and he would sit up on the roof and talk life, cutting shingles and fixing the valleys right and doing it right, teaching the roofing things that you need to know. But somewhere in that process, Bill's values transferred to the, to the person that was working with him. That happens. As you engage and rub shoulders, the values of you following God and who he is just kind of transfers. It's been said that it's more caught than taught. I mean, there's times of teaching, 
And there's times of explanation. And there's times of get in the Bible and do the Bible study. That's true. But there's also times when you just rub shoulders with somebody. And God is at work. And he's moving his spirit that's within you to help and strengthen the person you're with. Well, Bill Libby started coming to our church in 2001 when we planted the one in Monmouth. Him and his wife, Sheila, showed up our first Sunday of a church plant. I've done a few of them, and I know how this goes. All your friends and your family come to, out of pity to sit with you <laughs> when you have your first service. So we had, like, we blew all records. I only expect, we had 42 people. Oh, they were all, you know, 38 of them were our direct descendants up to, <laughs> of my family. And they weren't, they, they traveled and then they left. Next Sunday, I think we had nine. <laughs> and, and Bill and Sheila Libby were part of that group. Because he had retired from pastoring. He said, I just want to come and sit on the other side for a while and just bless a church. Well, he became one of our core leaders. One of the people who shaped our whole family of churches. He's, he's one who taught me what servant leadership is about. I remember a meeting when we were upstairs and we were struggling with what to do next and what to do and how we were going to structure things. And he got up and he just so, he's just a skinny little dude and he got up, can I just take an invisible piece of chalk here and write on this invisible chalkboard? And he did it and he said, I'm writing on the bottom of this big pyramid us, our names. We are underneath this church. We're not over it. And he taught what surrender was. Well, Bill Libby passed away. Right before he passed away, he had a house in California that we needed to remodel and sell. So I put the word out for volunteers, and I was really astounded that we had 15 volunteers that went down to Redding, California in, in the hot fall. It was August. It, it was, oh, it's hot. We walked into this house that had been locked up for a while, and the swamp cooler had been sitting there, and somebody flipped the switch to the swamp cooler, and we were all just like, hua, 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 and we ran out of the house because it was like the worst smell you could ever smell. <laughs> well, in that weekend, we transformed that house. It went from a value of 150 to 180, which sold right away. And he was able to take that money and, Retire a bit. 13 of those 15 volunteers were pastors. Most of them at one time were roofers <laughs> with Bill. I mean, fixing the roof on that place was no, no problem at all. Can I just tell you, you don't know the impact you're making. But leaders develop sons and daughters. And God has called you to take that role. It may not be in a, a official church role, but it might be in a family role, or it might be in a neighbor role. You might not even have any family or nearby family, but there's somebody you can help and bless, and somebody you can develop and encourage and strengthen. And there's no telling what, you, what difference you make. There's no telling. I haven't coached wrestling for four years. And I got a goofy little text from a kid who told me that he had been seated second. And I thought, who is this? And he told me his name. And I remembered it. And I remembered, and his text said, I knew, he said, I knew you would want me to know. Whoa. Honestly, here's, here's what you and I have to know carefully. Our time, our investment in people is precious. It's valuable. It's impacting. You add Jesus to that mix, and you take Jesus into the mixture of your love and acceptance of others around you, and you're going to start developing sons and daughters in the faith. And someday they're going to remodel your house and there will be a whole bunch of people <laughs> there to help. So leaders develop sons and daughters. They also uh, bring order. They bring order. 
Um, Paul said to Titus, um, the reason the reason I left you in Crete was so that you might put in order what was left and unfinished. What was left and unfinished. There is a calling on us to do what is left and unfinished in people's lives. Um, My favorite verse, my favorite chapter in the Bible, I know there you shouldn't have, I guess, well, the one I go to a lot. John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. The hired hand is not a shepherd. He does not own the sheep. So when he sees a wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And then the wolf attacks and fox in the and and attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and he he doesn't care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, verse 14, John 10. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. So we're talking about not building your own kingdom, not bringing order to your own world. We're talking about bringing order to the world of people around us that need the Jesus order. The chaos that they've been suffering, the world that has been crumbling, the difficulties they've been having, you take Jesus into that mix. You pray with them, you talk with them, you interact with them, and somewhere in the mix, the the Jesus, the Holy Spirit within you, it's caught by them, they understand it, and they start following him. Leaders bring order. Um, I, I sometimes will make the comparison, don't get me wrong, that I like funerals better than weddings. I don't mean I like people to die more than get married. But at a funeral, everybody is so loving you say, there's not enough chairs. Where can I get chairs? They bring chairs. There's not enough food. Oh, there's always, they'll bring potato salad like crazy. <laughs> Weddings, there's not enough chairs in here. Who are we going to get? Or there's not enough food. I knew that the caterers should bring more food. Now, Lila and I have done 88 weddings. All the weddings that we've done here or online have been our favorite. (laughs) Sometimes, weddings will not have a coordinator. Have you ever been to a wedding without a coordinator? I, well, my wife is an instant coordinator. In fact, If you are a relative of the bride and you're causing problems at a wedding rehearsal, Lila will take you out. (laughs) She's skinny, but she's strong. And she does not tolerate brides being upset. We've had crying brides before. Oh, my goodness. My mom wants to move the flowers over here, and I want them here. And, you know, big things like that. And, and she... <laughs> photographers. Oh, photographers. If you're a wedding photographer, just plug your ears for a minute. Because <laughs> photographers, they take forever. They go on and on, and they got the right light and all this stuff. One time, a photographer was hanging out in the aisle. Down comes the bride, and she was a very... A, a, a large wedding photographer and she was leaning out and she lost her balance and fell in the aisle and the whole church just shook <laughs> <laughs> and her camera was, parts were rolling around and she was getting it and the, the bride just paused we were talking with, with uh, Matt and Holly the other night uh, we did their wedding 20 years ago they still haven't gotten over their photographer <laughs> Because Lila had to take that photographer and have a talking to her. Said, listen, you're the photographer. 
you'll be done now, and the wedding will start. Um, but wedding coordinators are amazing because everybody comes and they don't know. This is a big deal because weddings are, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things happening. And a wedding quarter, coordinator, after I do my little prayer at the beginning of rehearsal, the wedding coordinator sets everybody up, puts them in place, and peace rests on the team. I know you don't all want to become wedding coordinators. We don't want to nickname you all Frank or anything like that. <laughs> but there's a role to play for people of Jesus in the kingdom of God that comes into the midst of chaos. And our culture has a lot of chaos. And you are going to enter the room. And you're going to enter the place. And they need a witness of Jesus. They need a presence of God. They need a leader of, of strength in the spirit. It's not a personality thing. It's a spiritual thing that God uses you in moments of critical times. And you bring order to chaos. Um, leaders understand community. They see the picture. Paul said to Titus, hey, I want you to go from town to town, place to place, and bring order. Wow, what a calling to go place to place and bring order. So he might say to you, I want you to go to the grocery store and then go to the Macy's or TJ Maxx, but wherever you go, bring my order, bring my peace. And you understand that there's community everywhere you go. There's communities of workers. There's communities of people who are working and serving. And what a difference we can make with the presence of God as we walk. We walk into a place where our, our children are and we bring a peace and we bring the presence of God and we bring order or we're part of the problem. We understand that this is bigger than us. Um, Lila and I planted the church in Monmouth right by the campus because we had college ki high school kids graduate from our youth group, which we really had a, a really great youth group. But they would, they would go from youth age into college and struggle. And I started to identify why that was happening because I would talk to them and I'd follow up with them. How you doing? You find it in a church home over there in the, in the place you're at because they were in different universities and different places. And they said, well, we tried a few of them, but no, I'm not sure. It's, it's, not, it's not working. And I, I even went and visited some college campuses and took students to places uh, to check in with the pastor or the minister of college or whatever they were. But I discovered something. Uh, and Lila and I both discovered that churches, uh, typically it's not an easy demographic to serve. College students uh, are messy, some of them. They don't tithe much on their student loans. They're there for a semester, sometimes two, maybe a year, and at the most, a couple of years, rarely for four. And so churches kind of think, oh, new college kid, there you go. And so they weren't, the, the people that we, the, the youth that we talked to, they said they just didn't feel that welcome. So that's why we felt like God called us to plant a church next to Western Oregon University. So we started a church. It was right across the street. It was amazing how God opened the doors for that building. And it was really cool how it all started. So we're there and we wanted to have soup for college kids. So we had like, a, you know, nine college kids in our group that we got. it, And we said, we have soup for you downstairs. And I didn't let anybody else but college kids go down for soup. And the college students said, um... It's not going to work. We don't want to have soup just with us. We want to have soup with, uh, with the older people. So I had to learn that college students actually 
love us and we love them. Well, one of these kids in our group uh, said she's starting a Bible study in her dorm. And she started in her dorm. She just reads through the Bible and then talks about it with her girls on her floor. Well, then they started bringing some football players. And then it was the Wednesday night Bible study and all the football players, it's too many to fit in her dorm room. So that one of the football players said, well, we rented a house. So they go down to the football player's house and they start doing Wednesday night Bible study in the football player's house. Same, same little girl, reading the Bible and talking about what it says and listening to other people interact. And Wednesday night Bible study, people were starting, to, you know, to really catch. She came to me and said, hey, um, we had over 50 at the football player's house. Can we use the church? And I was like, well, yeah. That's why we came to town. And I didn't know quite what to do. I just said, here. I took the key off. And I said, here's a key. Uh, a few months went by. And we heard it's really going well. And Lila and I were going by the church on Wednesday night. We hadn't been attending because they were doing their thing quite well without us and we walk in and the place was packed and there were it was the room was dark the, the music was you know and the sound system was just there were like five people pouring over the sound system doing stuff and there were this the offensive line for western Oregon Wolves were standing on the back pew of our church. Big, big suckers, big, huge guys. And they're trying to peer over all the heads to watch the 27 baptisms that were happening that night. Pizza boxes everywhere. <laughs> Parents with sh that looked shell shocked. Because they came from somewhere to watch their kid get baptized, and they weren't even believers. They didn't know what was going on. And these kids, they didn't just baptize one at a time in a nice, orderly way. There were like five or six in the tub. <laughs> praying and dunking them and praying some more. And Lila said to me, what did we do? I think she might have said, what have we done? And I said, I gave him a key. Sometimes your leadership is just going to be giving permission to someone who needs it. Sometimes your leadership is going to give space to someone who needs it. You're going to have to have a vision for the community that they are serving to give them freedom and release. This is an important thing to get and grasp because this is not about our kingdom, our leadership, our thing that we're trying to build. It's about the kingdom of God that's expansive and big and everywhere. And he wants to change our culture with the presence and power of his Holy Spirit. It can't be done if we elevate a leader and then just, you all just come listen and learn and go home and come back next week. No. God's going to have an encounter with you when you leave and when you interact with people. It might be with your own family. You, but I'm asking you to understand and catch a glimpse of the communities in which you land and the communities in which you serve. Come to understand that you can bring a sense of order, the, or, the order of the Holy Spirit, to places where you work and where you interact and, and where you do your life. In some place, your leadership is going to encounter and emerge in a big moment. Might not seem big. Might be just handing them a key. Might be just giving them a word of encouragement. But can I just tell you, we are in a world, it's not just our political world that needs leaders. It's our culture that needs leaders. The political problem will take care of itself if we step up and let God do what he needs to do in us. I probably should say that again. 
the chaos and leadership problem we have in this world will take care of itself if the people of God step up and lead in the way we're supposed to. Okay. But the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me. He wants to lead you. And he wants you to lead others on this journey we call walking with Jesus. We need to finish the job of bringing to order in the communities we come around and involve ourselves with. Um, knowing in preparation of this topic and subject, I knew there'd be people who feel like, well, I'm not a leader. Just let me be quiet and do my thing. Well, permission granted on the last part. Permission not granted on you calling yourself not a leader. Because I think I can prove that someone is influenced by you. To the positive or to the negative. Someone is influenced by you. Sometimes it's just showing up. There's an older couple in our first church that we planted, Bev and Ray Graff. And they weren't, you know, flashes in the pan. They weren't dynamic teachers of the word. They didn't sing. They could really dance. So at weddings, they were just fun to watch. They really <laughs> smooth. The old school dancing, you know, they were so fun to watch. But they took it upon themselves to attend weddings of people that didn't necessarily have a lot of family. They would travel to Canada, to other provinces. They would travel to other states. They would just show up at weddings and encourage the people and they were powerful influencers for the kingdom of God. So I, I want you to not get all low in your self-esteem. God has called you. And he wants you to be humble. So there, you're halfway there. He wants you to be humble and realize that the calling of leadership upon you might be a phone call. It might be a plate of cookies for your neighbor. It might be stopping and slowing down when someone is, is in a place of need. Let's bow our heads. Jesus, thank you for being our leader and our great example of, man, Lord, you were interrupted all the time and you stopped. And thank you, Lord, for leading us in your way. I pray, Lord, that as we sit together, those who might have come today feeling that they didn't really have a place or a purpose in life, that you would wake up a calling in them that is from you, that you would lead them, and as you lead them, they would find uh, that they are leading others. Help us to step up and be at your service in your kingdom. In your name we pray, amen.